The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. It is indeed a good morning to be gathered together in God's house with God's people. I think I speak for everyone when I say having Mark back in person is the best thing that we could have asked for, man. We are blessed beyond measure to have you back, brother. Amen. Well, friends, we are going to worship the Lord who is worthy of worship, and we're going to start with prayer, so let's pray. God, we come before you now thankful that you gather us in, thankful that you call us your own, thankful for faces we have not seen in all too long. God, in this space, in the words that we utter, in the songs that we sing, we ask that we would praise you with a worthy heart and with worthy minds because, God, no words we could utter would be worthy of you. So, God, may you move in this space. May your spirit descend. May it be felt by us, equipping us, guiding us forth. For, God, we are yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Let's stand and sing. Come on in.
be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Can we agree that we are creatures of our Creator? Life is good. Let's bow our heads. Almighty God, great geometrician of the universe, thou hast promised where two or more are gathered together, thou would be in thy midst. Grant that we beseech thee the petition of thy servants as may be most expedient in them. Grant us in this world knowledge and vigor in pursuit of thy trust everlasting lest we forget, lest we forget. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. This morning, I'm going to read from the, uh, Matthew 3, John's proclamation and the baptism of Jesus Christ. Matthew 3. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming repentance for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is the one of whom Isaiah spoke, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore camel's hair clothing with a leather belt, around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then people of Jerusalem were going out to meet him and all regions along the Jordan confessing their sins. But when John saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warranted you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of your repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we are Abraham's ancestors. For I tell you, God is able from stone to raise up children of Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming, and I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with his Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing flood and gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff... He will burn it with a quenching fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would not pretend or prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized. 
I need to baptize you and you do come to me? But Jesus answered, let it be so. Now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as come up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Holy Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning about him. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So mote it be. see a couple extra children out there. (laughs) Well, how are you today, guys? I have a question for you. Do you know the difference between a leader and a boss? Probably not. Okay, what about you? What do you think? Bosses are meaner. Well, I, I, I I might be inclined to agree. As I understand it, a boss is somebody that tells you what to do, orders you around, and wants you to get things done. Now, a leader is very similar, except for one thing different. A leader can be a boss, but a boss can't be a leader. A leader is somebody that may tell you what to do, but they show you how to do it by setting that example for you. They show, like if you have a job and you don't know how to do it, A good leader will show you how to do it by doing it themselves. Somebody that inspires you to be better and encourages you. That's what a leader is. That's kind of what happened in our Bible story today. John the Baptist is baptizing people to wash away their sins and to repent to be forgiven of their sins. So when Jesus came, he had John baptize him. Now, John was a little bit confused because he's like, you know, you are the son of God. You're perfect. You don't have any sins. Why am I baptizing you? You should be baptizing me. Well, Jesus said, well, it's to fulfill what the scripture said. But another reason why I believe Jesus did this is because even though he didn't need to do that because he was already perfect, him being a leader, he showed us what we should do by being that example for us. So when we go and be baptized and we decide we want to be baptized, Jesus showed us how to do it. Not by telling us how to do that, but by doing it himself. Do you guys know what it means to be baptized? Besides, okay, Mason, or Mason, right? Yeah. You forgot? Okay. To wash away your sins. It symbolizes washing away your sins. So when you go and be baptized, it's where you've decided that you don't want to live as that person that did all those bad things. And now you want to become somebody new through Jesus. And so we didn't understand how that worked exactly. So that's why Jesus did it first. And if you look at the Bible and look at a lot of the stuff Jesus did, just about everything he did, he did it first to show us how to do it. Even baptism. So, at some point, each one of you may decide that you want to be baptized. Well, when you guys decide that you want to be baptized, understand that you decide that you don't want to be the old person that wasn't close to Jesus, and instead you want to be that new person that's had all the bad stuff washed away and decided that you want Jesus to be the most important thing in your life. So when you guys get older... And as you continue to learn in your Sunday schools and your Bible studies more and more about Jesus, you'll start to understand more what baptism is and how important it'll be. So keep your studying and keep listening. And uh, the more you learn, the smarter you'll get. Let's go ahead and 
and have a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come as your people to serve you and to learn about you and to follow the example that you set for us in our lives. You have truly been the great leader that set the standard for everything we know and do. And it's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. All right, thank you, everybody.
As we gather, we come rejoicing, we come with stress, we come with all the stuff of this life, thankful that God meets us right here as we are, but He never leaves us that way. As such, we're going to go to God in prayer. You have an opportunity to pray quietly, and then I will lift up a prayer on our behalf. Let's pray. Oh God, we gather this morning praising you in the name of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We gather as those who have heard His call, those who have heard the call of the Baptist to repent and believe. We come responding to that invitation of grace. Yet simultaneously, Lord, we recognize, we proclaim, we admit. We heed those words imperfectly at best. And quite frankly, Lord, we make a mess of it. God, we come with us bringing all of our imperfection, all of our mistakes, the things that we do and leave undone, the baggage that keeps us from answering the call, the darkness we cannot allow your light into, the things which we hold so tightly to, we cannot open our hands to you in praise. And God, in this space, we offer them all to you. The ways in which we need to be changed, the ways in which we know we cannot change ourselves. Asking as you, the one who called us to the waters of baptism, to once again make us whole, make us clean, make us new. Thankful that you do. Thankful that every time we gather, every time we come before you, we get a fresh start, a clean slate, and that each day is the new day of our eternal life. That, O oh God, is good news. And because of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you do look at us and call us to your beloved children. And as your beloved children, we get to approach you boldly. And so we approach you now, lifting up our cares and our concerns, our heartbreak, our loss, giving it all to you. Lord God, we lift those to you whom need a healing touch. God, we know so many in hospitals and returning from hospitals, those who are in a revolving door of endless treatments, endless procedures, not knowing when the healing will come, not knowing what the resolution will be. God, their names are many. Each one of us holds space in our hearts and our minds for those whom we love, giving thanks that as much as we may grieve or want or hope for their healing, God, you love them even more. So God, in each of these situations, heal the bodies which you have made as you will according to your will, we pray. Surround them with your strength and peace. Give them your grace and abundance, we pray. God, we lift up to you all those, your beloved children, who experience brokenness not of body but of situation. That of injustice. Suffering of broken relationships, suffering of broken systems. All those things that remind us, God, that when we are trying to be like your kingdom, our world has a long, long way to go. God, may your healing descend there too in broken families, in broken communities. Healing and restoring that which you have made, ordering it according to your kingdom and family. God, we lift up to you the groanings of our world, the brokenness that we see everywhere we look, the hurt, the dissension, and ask, Lord, for you to act because we confess we are not enough, but also proclaiming, God, that you call us to be Christ's instruments of peace. 
So God help us, your church, not to stand idly by on the sidelines, but to take the steps where you guide us, to be bold, to be courageous, to be the servants of our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. So January is always kind of an interesting time in the preaching cycle, in the scripture reading of the church, because no matter which kind of early Jesus stories you look at, at some point you have to face facts that the Gospels fast forward by like 20 years at least. It seems like in the blink of an eye we go from baby Jesus in a manger or baby Jesus fleeing, and then maybe you get Jesus at the temple as a child, or maybe you get the story where he sneaks away from his parents for three days as an adolescent, but at some point, the gospel goes from zero to 60. Things escalate quickly, and that's where we are today. Last we talked, we were in the birth narratives, the visits of the wise men, and now Jesus shows up to get baptized. And granted, you might still see him as a young one, because we tend to baptize at that magical age of around, you know, like 8 to 12, where you've got everything figured out. I say that in jest, you will never know. You're baptized at infant or baptized at 90, you're still learning. But no, Jesus is roughly 30 at this point. He's all grown up, and we see him here about to embark on his earthly ministry. We have this story today that is a beautiful collision of very human Jesus, who grew up, who comes down to see what's up with his cousin and who is baptized. And we also see here the crossroads of that divinity, an unveiling of who he is and what he's going to do because we see here, as best I can figure, like nowhere else, the Trinity in one place at one time. Jesus in the water. The voice of God proclaiming from on high while the Spirit descends like a dove. And the Father claims the Son and the dove alights on Him and it sets the course of Christian theology for thousands of years to come. It's this beautiful moment. Knowing that all of Jesus' teaching, all of His healing, even the ministry that will be consecrated on a cross and celebrated with an empty tomb begins right here at baptism. But we don't know what comes before it. And the guy baptizing him, his camel hide clad cousin, who's going to be the one doing the baptizing, well, he's grown up too. Last we talked about him was when his father was told you're going to have a baby and then couldn't talk for a year. We talked about when Elizabeth welcomed Mary and the baby in her womb, the baby that would be John the Baptist, leaps at Mary's greeting. Because John does in utero what he will be doing for the rest of his life, which is get people's attention to say the Messiah is near, and he will do that in painful and uncomfortable ways, like a kicking baby. Or calling the Pharisees a brood of vipers. So we get a little window into who John's going to be. By the way, I expanded the scripture reading today just because when I knew Dave was going to read with his booming voice, I really wanted to get that brood of vipers line in there in Dave's voice. It was just too great. <laughs> so what is their relationship before this? We know they met before they were even born. We know they're related. Mary and Elizabeth are cousins, but we don't know. When John saw Jesus coming, did he go, Hey, cousin, what's up? Haven't seen you since the family reunion. Haven't seen you since you did that cool thing with water to wine. No. We don't know their background. We don't know their story. Was John a child who grew up hearing, by the way, you have this really important cousin who you're supposed to proclaim who's kind of hiding out in Egypt right now because the king wants him dead? Or was he part of the extended family when they went to the temple and a 12-year-old Jesus disappeared in the biggest city in their part of the world for three days? Did John the Baptist go, glad he's not me, when he heard Mary and Joseph talking about what they were going to do to him when they found him? And maybe that's why we don't hear anything out of Jesus for roughly 18 years, because if I pulled a stunt like that, I'd be grounded at least that long. This could be the first time he was allowed out of his room. No, we, we have no idea. 
And we know very little about John the Baptist's life. We just see these little points where it crosses over with God's story, with Jesus' story, and is folded in to the divine narrative. Yet I will say, when looking at John the Baptist, what little we know about this weird, loud, gruff guy, John the Baptist is probably exactly what every follower of Christ should strive to be, should strive to do. So what do we know about John the Baptist? Well, the first thing we know is he was set apart for a special purpose and he lived like it. From the very beginning, from before his birth, his parents were told this child is something special. That's why as the church we dedicate children. That's why so many faith traditions baptize children is to say, even before you have any idea of what God is calling you to do, long before you could ever choose God, God chose you. God set you apart. Grace moved first. And he will grow up knowing that. Maybe he is trained by his priest father. We don't really know. But his first mention here is he appears in the wilderness. The Gospels all tell a little bit different story of John, but they all agree about a couple of things. One, he is the guy Isaiah was talking about when Isaiah said, a voice in the wilderness calls out, prepare the way of the Lord, make a path straight. They all agree this is the guy Isaiah was talking about. Two, they all agree he baptized Jesus and some way or another the voice and the dove were involved. And three, they all agree that he was kind of weird. That he is a prophet not like anybody expected because, well, he's out there wearing camel hide and eating bugs dipped in honey. It's kind of odd. And his message is, well, it's not a new message, but it's done, well, pretty in your face. Pretty bluntly. I mean, when the Pharisees come and it says they came to be baptized, like they're, they're buying into this, he literally, instead of saying, well, I think you might be in theological error, brother, he calls them brood of vipers. Literally, sons of serpent, you son of a snake, what are you doing here? He's weird. He talks weird. He acts weird. He eats weird. And between the duds and the diet and the desert, he probably smells weird. John's out there. And he doesn't care to fit in. He's not a prophet like anybody is expecting. But he doesn't have a new message, right? Repent and believe. Be baptized. His message is simple. Honestly. In the Lucan account, he gives that message and it says some tax collectors came to be baptized. And they say, okay, we've been baptized, now what? He goes, you're a tax collector? Yeah. Don't extort from people. Go. And soldiers came to him to be baptized, and he says, don't abuse people. Go. And regular people came and were baptized, and they said, what now? And he says, if you have an extra cloak, maybe give it to somebody who needs it. It's almost like for all his bluster, for all of his oddness, for all of his camel hide, bug-eating antics, he's here to say, repent, believe, Love God and love neighbor. And there's one coming who's kind of a big deal. John the Baptist's message is simple, but his earnestness, yes, his gruffness, and his urgency stands out. And we know it did because people came. It says they came from all around. People heard this, and ordinary folks started confessing their sins and being baptized. There was something in John's that was confrontational, but yet brought with it hope and a good news. Unlike any other, judgment is coming that is inescapable. You're not going to measure up on your own, and there's one way out, and it's God's grace. There was something in that that hooked the hearts of these people, and they're baptized, and they leave the water changed. And there's something in that that not only comforted the afflicted, but afflicted the comfortable. Because the Pharisees and the learned scribes, they came to and said, who do you think you are? Are you Elijah come back? Are you a prophet? Are you the Messiah that some of y'all are talking about? His words were effective. He had people's attention and he didn't pull 
any punches. But when they asked him all these things, we see the next key point about John, that which we all can learn a great deal about, and that is he never failed to point away from himself and to Jesus Christ, even before he knew who he was. Are you a prophet? No. Are you Elijah? No, I'm John. Are you the Messiah? Shoot, no. Not worthy to, in one telling, untie his sandals, and I read today, carry his shoes along behind him. I'm baptizing with water, he will baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. When people looked at John, John pointed back to God. It was weird. They looked because he was confrontational. They looked because he was loud and told them some things, and he said, No, I'm nothing. There's one coming who is everything. We also see that his very first disciples went and became the core group of Jesus' disciples because Jesus is walking by and he says, Look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And his disciples didn't get it. And Jesus walks by the next day and he says it again, kind of with a head nod, like, Yo, go. And they become the start of Jesus' disciples. When he is asked at one point, what do you think about Jesus doing all this? You know what he says? He says, the key thing that I think should be at the heart of every follower of Jesus Christ, well, he must increase and I must decrease. John does a great thing there. And we know too, John wasn't afraid of the cost. Because he called out Herod, he called out the king for his own sin got locked up for it, wouldn't shut up about it, and it cost him his head. That's a pretty powerful picture of John. But there's one more thing that we see about John from this little snippet and others, and that is John's imperfect. John is working with a limited understanding, and here we saw it today, it almost got in the way of God. Jesus comes to be baptized by John. John knows Jesus is something special, and John says, no. It says he would have prevented him. Here is God's plan. God's calling for Jesus to come to the water of baptism, and I love the way Chris told it as an example, because Jesus will not ask you to do anything he's not willing to do. He has gone through it all, whether he needed it or not. And yet John would have prevented him because all John could see is, I'm not up to this task. I'm not worthy to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. But the good news is, John wasn't big enough to stop Jesus. And neither are we. So we see all of these things, that John is confrontational, that he's loud, that he's weird, he's odd, he's passionate, His words hit home. They find effect on people, both comforting and confrontational. He doesn't pull punches. He calls right, right, and wrong, wrong. He always points to Christ. Is there something in there for us? Is there a word in there for how we, God's church, are to behave and are to act and are to live? Even in John's weirdness, Because I will tell you one thing, John was completely himself and in no way his own. John shows us you can be fully yourself, though you are completely not your own. And that should be a message that is both humbling and extremely freeing to hear. Because friends, we live in a world that tries to sell us individuality. Tries to sell us this ideal of I am special and I need this and I need to, to my own self, be true. And if it feels good, do it. And if I think it's right, it's my truth. And I'm special, just like everybody else. But yet at the same time, only to the degree that I go along to get along, only to the degree that it doesn't upset those in power or the status quo, right? Yet what John shows us, you can be just who you are. Your weirdness, your interests, your odd wardrobe and odd diet, your proclivities, the way you communicate, all of those things that make you you and are individually unique to you, 
are a gift from God that you do not have to be ashamed of. You don't have to hide. You don't have to make smaller to try to fit in. But yet, they exist to serve God's glory. And your individual realization and fulfillment are a byproduct of that, not the goal themselves. No, John doesn't try to speak like Isaiah or Amos or Jonah or any other prophet, even though that's exactly the message he's conveying. Repent. Believe. When Jonah got spit out by the whale and walked the streets of Nineveh, what did he say? Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. He had the same message, but he told it in his own way like he was on borrowed time. He didn't try to make it acceptable or fit in or change his clothes or change his look or eat a little more like everybody else. No, he was him fully sold out for God's cause. Because of that, when people looked at him, if they saw anything worth seeing, it was him pointing to Christ. Friends, that is a message for us. You, as a follower of Christ, can be more authentically yourself than you can any other way, than you can serving any other cause. As long as you give that all, your personality, your your talents, your interests, and your abilities to God's glory 100%. Because friends, remember, last time I talked about how different our interests and age groups and all those things are in the church. Well, John was different. So maybe you don't like bugs and honey, but maybe you eat weird. Maybe you're one of those vegans. Fine, be vegan, I don't care. But everywhere you go, point to the bread of life and the cup of salvation. We have some sure enough country folk, cowboys in this church. One of them read scripture for me. Great, rock on with your 10-gallon hat wearing self, but you ride for the brand of God's coming kingdom in everything you do and everywhere you are. We have some awesome people here who kind of have that laid-back hippie vibe to them, like peace, love, and good vibes, bro. Cool, rock on with your very chilled-out self that I am jealous of, but know that the only source of peace, love, and goodness in this world is Jesus Christ. Be you, 110%, but know that you are completely, irrevocably not your own and act like it. And then we also see that we, like John, are not perfect. We're going to mess up. John tried to prevent Jesus from being baptized. He tried to prevent God's plan from coming to pass, and he was not strong enough. And we will mess up and we will be imperfect. And by golly, praise God, we are not strong enough to stop him either. I heard a pastor a couple months back pray before he got into the pulpit at this big conference. And he prayed, God, save me from myself and get me out of your way. And by golly, I thought that was the best thing a pastor could ever pray. And I have added it now. Because we get in God's way just like John the Baptist did. But thankfully, you can't stop him. Did you know what? John the Baptist also doubted. Here in chapter 3, he hears the voice. He dunks the Son of God. He sees the dove descend. And in chapter 11, when he's in jail, he hears about Jesus. And he sends his disciples and says, Hey, go ask that Jesus guy, my cousin. Ask him if he's the one I'm waiting for or should I be looking for somebody else. Isn't that amazing? John the Baptist doubted. He had a dark night where he couldn't see anywhere out, and Jesus wasn't who he expected him to be. Jesus surprised him. Jesus was not made in his image, and he said, man, I don't know if I'm on board with this. And he sent his disciples to go question Jesus, and Jesus says, go back and tell him. The lame are healed, the dead are raised. Tell him yes. And then Jesus, right after that, instead of condemning John, says, let me tell you about John. Nobody born is greater than him but the least in the kingdom of God is. Even then, Jesus used John's imperfection, John's weakness, to point to his coming kingdom and sovereign glory. Yes, friends, like John the Baptist, we can be ourselves sold out for his cause. And yes, we will be imperfect. We will try to get in God's way. Yes, we will have our moments of doubt and our moments of mess up. But if John the Baptist wasn't strong enough to derail God's plans for him, neither are you. And neither am I. And that is good news. So however God has made you uniquely you, whatever you're wearing, whatever you're eating, however you speak, 
whether eloquently or gruffly. Even if you're one of those people who enjoys golf, which I don't understand because I have to repent of my attitude and language for four weeks afterwards. Whether you're a sports person or a fishing person, whatever God made you to be, go be it with all your heart. Because people will look at you. And some people will look at you simply because you're different and weird. Some people may look at you because they go, look, how has God got them through all they've been through? Some people may look at you because of what you say or what you proclaim. But if we're being John the Baptist type people, for whatever reason they come out to look at us, whatever they listen to us trying to hear or see, they cannot help but see the Lord to whom we point. The one about whom we say, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes, yet his hands and feet were pierced anyways. We are come baptizing with water, but there is one who sends the Spirit. That's the one we're talking about. And that's the one who invites us here into this family and here into this table. So yeah, we don't know a whole lot about John the Baptist. But I pray we can go forth being a whole lot like him. Amen. Join together and sing Spirit of God. Spirit Here we come to this table to proclaim that the one whose sandals we are not worthy to untie gave himself for us, invited us to this table, and commanded that we remember him this way. So we remember how on the night when our Lord was to be betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup, is a new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take, drink in remembrance of me. Sisters and brothers, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim his life, death, and resurrection until he comes again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this table reminds us that love is the only redemption force in the world. Let the Spirit guide us to realize that the kingdom of love can come on earth only as we, the children, are willing to live in accordance with the pattern of life laid down by the Son, Jesus. Help us to remember that as Christ died, so must we live that others may know thee through him. Forgive us of our sins and give us everlasting salvation through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Now let's say the prayer that God has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom and the power and the glory.
This is not a Disciples of Christ table. This is not First Christian Church's table. This is the Lord's table. As such, all who seek Christ are welcome and encouraged here. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is the time where we make our love visible through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let's give with cheerful hearts. Accept the gifts of our hands and the thankfulness of our hearts. Hearts and hands and voices all lifted in praise to you. Amen. Amen.
We come to the table as we come to the waters of baptism, invited by a God who invites us. As such, we go forth offering that invitation. We do it out there in a number of ways, but we also do it here. If there's anyone who feels they have heard the call of Christ and would like to make a confession of faith or would like to join with us in this worshiping body as we pursue to point towards Christ in all we do, the table is always open, especially during the next song. Now go in peace, friends, with this benediction. As you go forth, go forth in thanksgiving, for indeed you are God's beloved child. And may His Holy Spirit empower you to point to our Lord everywhere you go. Amen.